Nietzsche said, if you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. With metamaterials, how it stares back at you depends on how you designed your abyss. Today we will be looking at metamaterials, a somewhat ambiguous concept oftentimes defined as any material engineered to have properties not found in nature. If you stop and think about that definition though, it basically covers any material that humans have made in their journey from the Bronze Age and up. As most metals are rarely found in their pure form in nature and alloys like bronze even less so. We might stretch the point for some alloys and materials like glass which do occur in nature but which we've learned to make with different properties. Purified metals, alloys, semiconductors, ceramics, plastics, and almost everything we use besides wood and stone tend to be materials we manufacture from the ground up these days. For our purposes today, this definition is simply too broad. The main characteristic of most things called a metamaterial is its ability to manipulate waves of light and sound as well as electromagnetic properties on the macro scale. So let's use this to narrow our definition. Now there are many theoretical applications of advanced materials that we can and will get into in future episodes on strange materials. These include computronium, a theorized type of computing material, neutronium, a hyperdense stabilized form of the pure neutron material in neutron stars, strange matter and anything made out of quarks besides the up and down quark, and material like smart matter or utility fog that can take on programmed shapes. However, in this episode we will focus primarily on the electromagnetic and acoustic metamaterials, as this is the most understood aspect and is already beginning to have an impact on the world around us. Some theoretical applications have wonderful and absolutely crazy potential uses, but even without them, the electromagnetic and acoustic metamaterial applications are poised to drastically alter our future in ways that few can truly envision. I don't want to delve into the physics too much, but this typically revolves around properties of materials called permeability and permittivity. These properties also affect the index of refraction of a material, essentially how the material reacts to magnetic fields, electric ones, and light. Most materials have positive values for permittivity and permeability but some materials have either a negative permittivity or a negative permeability. No naturally occurring materials have both a negative permittivity and a negative permeability. The metamaterials we are talking about today, though, need both of these to be negative, and we'll get to how to achieve that shortly. Now, for ease of visualization, I'm going to be referring to light here, but it applies equally to visible light, infrared light, microwaves, and longer radio waves too. To explain a negative index of refraction, let us think of a vertical mirror that we bounce a beam of light off of from a high angle so our light comes in from the top left at an angle that hits the mirror and gets reflected away at an opposite angle towards the bottom left. Now if we replace the mirror with a metamaterial, but instead of vertical it is horizontal, we get much the same effect. The magic though is that we don't need a bulky mirror to reflect the light off of, but instead we have a material that can handle simultaneous beams hitting and refracting the light away as if we had millions of vertical mirrors in a series, ones that do not get in each other's way, too. Metamaterials that have a negative index of refraction are known as NIMS, Negative Index Materials, and they have that weird perpendicular mirroring effect that we do not see in normal materials like water where that index of refraction is what causes sticks stuck in water to appear to bend at the surface of the water with the air above, but not enough to appear to be a mirror because normal materials can only bend light inwards a little bit. So how do we make a metamaterial? The principle is that we construct geometric patterns out of at least one material with negative permeability and at least one other material with negative permittivity. Typically, these are arranged in repeating patterns called cells, and an individual cell is smaller on one side than the wavelength of light it is affecting. On the macro scale, the combination of the material with negative permeability 
and another material with negative permittivity is a material with a negative refractive index. Let us use your LED computer monitor screen to illustrate this. Your monitor is not a metamaterial, but this will still help explain how metamaterials work. The LED screen is composed of a large number of pixels. Each pixel is actually a collection of red, green, and blue LED elements. By turning on and off the red, green, and blue elements, much like turning on and off individual bulbs of a small collection of colored light bulbs in a cluster, a pixel is created that can generate almost any hue and brightness. Zoom out and you see this video you are watching now. You are not aware of what individual pixel hues and brightnesses are, and you are definitely not aware of what the individual LED elements are doing in those pixels. All you are interested in is that you can see the magical moving pixels that were fantasized about only a few generations ago, and that would have been treated as something approaching magic by your forebears. Your more recent forebears would have understood about colored lights and light switches, but they would not have any idea about how to miniaturize these to the level required, or be able to do it fast enough to create the impression of a moving picture. It is the same with metamaterials, the individual elements do not behave differently from normal materials we know about, but taken as a whole with the other individual elements, the metamaterials act very differently from what conventional materials do. In a metamaterial, its individual elements should be constructed into geometric shapes, again called cells, which are smaller than the wavelength of light, EM radiation, or sound that the material is designed to manipulate. This meant, up until recently, that metamaterials were designed to affect the radio spectrum and sound waves, and not visual light, because it was much easier to create elements that would work with the larger wavelengths of radio or sound. Microwaves have the shortest wavelength of radio, around a millimeter or larger, which is more than 7,000 times bigger than even the longest near-infrared wavelength of 1400 nanometers. Creating geometric patterns that have a size smaller than the 390 to 700 nanometers of visible light, or even the 750 nanometers to 1400 nanometers of the near-infrared spectrum, is a real challenge. The difficulty at these wavelengths of light is that atoms are only 0.1 to 0.3 nanometers across, so building elements becomes tricky because they are quite a limited number of atoms that will fit into those elements. As an example, while we think of human biological cells as quite tiny, they typically are many thousands of nanometers across, or even bigger, and thus you can see them with a microscope and visible light wavelengths. A cell in a metamaterial needs to be smaller than light, mere hundreds of nanometers. Now as you know, we've been getting good at making things smaller in recent decades, and transistors in modern processors are about 14 nanometers across, which is 50 times smaller than the longest wavelength of light we can see, deep red bordering on infrared, and about 30 times smaller than the smallest we can see, the blues and violets on the edge of the ultraviolet spectrum. So we are down in that range now, the trouble is that we have very little material to work with before we hit the wavelength size of the light we want to manipulate, and we're not making something homogenous and identical. That's not to say that metamaterials in the visible and infrared spectra are impossible, it's just that they are significantly more difficult to create. We have some examples of these and they are usually very fine layers of two very different materials where the layer combinations are much thinner than the wavelength of optical light. So let us talk first about the radio-based metamaterials and how to make them, because they are the ones we understand best and the ones that came first. As I said earlier, most natural materials have both positive permeability and positive permittivity. There are all exceptions though, ferrites have a positive permittivity but negative permeability. On the other hand, plasmas have a negative permittivity and a positive permeability. Metals have what is known as a plasma frequency, below the optical range of frequencies. At high frequencies, metals act like a plasma. Normally metals are a good conductor, but above the plasma frequency, they become poor conductors and currents cannot be excited properly. This causes the wave to pass through the metal as if it was in a lossy vacuum instead of a solid substance. If we make very small metal rods, we can get them to act like a plasma and get that negative permittivity for a designed wavelength range. If we make small ferrite rings, we can get that negative permeability for a designed wavelength range. 
These materials on their own do not give us any useful negative refraction though. The magic happens if we combine the rods and the rings, and you now have a metamaterial element. Multiply that out and you have a material with negative permeability and negative permittivity and a negative refractive index. Individually the rods and rings will not create that magical negative refraction, but in combination, they do. We now have our first metamaterial, but what can we do with it? Say you want to focus a beam of radio waves onto a receiver. If you use a slab of a conventional material as a focusing lens, it would disperse the radio waves even more. The opposite happens with a layer of our metamaterial, and the best thing is that the material can be made flat and it will still concentrate the waves on the receiver, which is great for electronics. We have achieved the holy grail of creating a perfect lens, one that focuses the radiation but does not require any variation in thickness of lens to do so. The more we can miniaturize this setup, the smaller the wavelength we can use this material for as a lens. We can also do other interesting things. Let us say we only want a very particular wavelength of radio waves to go into our receiver. For our example, say we want the Wi-Fi 2.4 GHz frequency, or 12.5 cm wavelength. We can tune the metamaterial elements so that the metamaterial only acts as a perfect lens for the Wi-Fi frequency range we want. Everything else will be scattered or reflected as would be the case with a normal material. Our signal to noise ratio suddenly gets much better and we get a more efficient and higher quality of Wi-Fi signal. We can introduce another effect, which is called the reverse Doppler effect where we can actually compensate for any Doppler effect by changing the geometry of the elements. You will know the Doppler effect if you have ever listened to the sound of a horn or a siren on a vehicle traveling past you. As it approaches you, the pitch rises, something we call blue shifting, and as it travels away from you, the pitch gets lower, something called red shifting. You will also know this from astronomy, as stars blue shift when approaching us and red shift while traveling away, which every star outside our galaxy and its closest neighbors is doing as the universe expands. In spacecraft, which move quite fast, this is a problem as signals that are transmitted get blue or red shifted, depending on whether the receiver and transmitter are approaching one another or getting further away. Compensating for this has been a major headache for NASA over the years, requiring expensive equipment to compensate for this phenomenon. We nearly got no data out of the Huygens spacecraft that entered the atmosphere of Saturn's moon Titan because of the Doppler issue with it and its mothership Cassini. This issue delayed the deployment of the Huygens probe from Cassini for years. In the future though, simply tuning our metamaterial means that we can reverse any Doppler effect and cause the receiver to pick up the exact frequency that it was designed to work best at. This is also great for spacecraft themselves as this makes the radio more reliable, lighter, and more energy efficient. Another great effect of the metamaterial is that it can take radio waves transmitted from a variety of angles and perfectly refract them onto the receiver, no more fiddling to get the best angle for receiving a signal. That's a good place to introduce a more real world example. Given the tendency to look at metamaterials for their military potential and my own background in the military, we'll use a martial scenario for that example. We have two soldiers, Romulus and Remus. Romulus is using conventional tech on the battlefield, whereas Remus is using metamaterial based tech. So how will they fail? Romulus sets up his camo gear and applies face paint to break up his appearance so he is not quite so obvious to the enemy. Unfortunately for Romulus, there is nothing that will really hide his infrared signature and he is far from being actually invisible. Covering up his gear with camo and the application of his face paint also takes precious time. His unit is moving into the battlefield, the unit cannot easily tell where other units might be located or even where each of the members of the unit are located. The reality is that friendly fire sometimes takes down friendly units, particularly when they can't see each other. After a hard day trudging through the battlefield, Romulus's unit gets a break and they rest up. The electronic equipment he carries has to be powered by heavy batteries due to the amount of power that they drain. Romulus sets up some solar panels to partially recharge the equipment and sets up a satellite uplink to get further orders. It takes a while for Romulus to set up the uplink as it has to be pointed in the right direction of the sky to get a signal through to the satellite and it is a hit and miss affair. 
After a while, he manages to contact his superiors and get further orders. The communications gear he has is encrypted to ensure that the enemy cannot listen in, but increasingly transmissions have been detected and decoded by the enemy. To compensate, the gear has become power hungry and slow because of the added encryption burden, meaning that he worries that the batteries might not hoard out or that the gear will take too long to send or receive messages to be useful. Even though the solar panels have been operating the whole time that he had his gear set up, they have barely improved the charge in the batteries, and he is worried that he might not have enough charge left in the batteries to complete the mission. They receive orders to scout out a nearby enemy encampment and send back images. They sneak closer and hope that they are not spotted. He carefully uses his camera to capture images of the camp and zooms into areas of the camp that might be of interest. The zoom capability is limited for the type of camera lens he has, as the more resolution he wants, the more bulky and heavy the lenses have to be. They do this at night as they do not want to be seen by enemy lookouts and snipers. This compounds the problem because the night vision capability of the lens and the camera is limited, he needs to get dangerously close to the encampment to get useful images as a result. Romulus' day ends badly when his squad is spotted and they have to make a hasty retreat under enemy fire. It takes several hours before he can set up an uplink to his superiors and provide them with the footage they required. Now as everyone knows, Murphy's Law, that anything that can go wrong will go wrong, is the first rule of warfare, and that's doubly true of both electronic equipment and the battlefield. True to form, the batteries give out before the images are uploaded and he has to try to explain them instead, by radio, what his squad saw, and hope it is enough detail for his superiors to make use of it. Remus, on the other hand, has quite a good day. He has a metamaterial infrared camo suit that directs his heat in a desired direction away from him, so when someone looks at him using an infrared night scope, they do not see heat coming from him. He also has the latest in chameleon suits, which bend light around him, making him invisible in the visible spectrum during the day too. Unlike in the movies, these metamaterials are robust and take hardly any power. The metamaterial radio transceivers he has allow pinpointing of his unit on the battlefield by friendlies. He always knows where everyone is at all times and there is no real possibility of friendly fire. It was a long trek that day, but the equipment he has is relatively light thanks to the metamaterials they use. They also use less power due to their increased efficiency than the equipment Romulus carried, so the batteries he carries are a lot smaller. He is also able to quickly and fully recharge his equipment using metamaterial solar panels that are much lighter and more efficient than the ones that Romulus was carrying. The metamaterial transceivers mean that it takes no time to set up a connection and get a signal through to the satellite, and his superiors have been monitoring his progress directly all along. The ultra-small and efficient metamaterial optoelectronic processors mean that very little power is needed to encrypt and decrypt communications and it happens in real time too. It's very easy to forget that one of the biggest bottlenecks on computation is how much energy is needed to flip each bit and the heat buildup doing that. Remus is even less exposed in this regard, as normal electronic equipment tends to stick out even more than people on thermal zone infrared detectors. They receive the same orders as Romulus to scout out a nearby enemy encampment and send back images. He uses his metamaterial camera to capture images of the camp and zoom into areas of the camp that might be of interest. The zoom capability is excellent, and being a perfect lens he is able to get the necessary images from well away from the camp, both in the visible spectrum and in the infrared. He is far less exposed to detection by being more distant and can more easily safely retreat if detected. He also wants to get heat signatures from the equipment in the camp, so waits until dark to get infrared images too. The night vision enabled enemy lookouts and snipers cannot see him through his chameleon and infrared camouflage suit. The images taken are beamed to his superiors in real time and they ask him to zoom in on various locations of the camp that they are interested in. Remus' day ends well as his squad is effectively invisible to the enemy and they make a clean getaway. Unlike Romulus, who retreated under fire and in doing so let the enemy know they'd been scouted, and react to change their deployment. 
Remus's day was nothing like Romulus's day, and that comes down simply to the metamaterial revolution that Remus is part of. Now, don't get the impression this represents perfect stealth by the way, there are quite a few ways to detect Remus, but he's much better hidden than Romulus was, and like all stealth, it's really about lowering the odds of detection against standard search efforts. So we see a major use of it, one that gets talked about a lot in science news, for chameleon effects, camouflage, and partial invisibility. Needless to say, every military is very interested in those applications. We can also use that for shielding as well, as such materials let us bend away light, electric, or magnetic fields from objects we need to protect from them or the noise they create. We also saw its value in receivers that don't have to move to track a satellite for instance. At the smaller scale, this also allows better transmission of wireless devices, further improved by the ability to make a perfect lens for a specific frequency or wavelength. They also potentially offer faster data processing, so we get far better phones and far better cameras on those phones as well. Your typical smartphone already has a camera vastly smaller and higher resolution than anything from a few decades back, and this only increases that more. Not only can they make better lenses to see things, but they might be able to do things that current lenses can't do at all. We talk about wanting very high speed broadband internet everywhere, and through metamaterials we can not only do that far easier, but also make the amount of power and the size of the receiver much smaller, and where fiber optics replaces copper wires, metamaterials can replace them as well. As I mentioned, we can potentially make solar power far more efficient and less bulky this way too, one half of our portability issue with devices is recharging them, the second half being storing that power, which we'll look at in more detail next week in Portable Power. However I mentioned that while their Cloak of Invisibility aspect is probably their best known application, it can be foiled. One obvious example of that is by sound and a cloak of invisibility isn't going to hide you from bats with echolocation or help you in a fight with Daredevil. Your covert scouting party can stay pretty silent but could still be detected by sound, tremors created by footsteps, or just doing what bats do and what whales and dolphins do underwater and blasting an area with sound and listening to echoes. I also mentioned earlier that metamaterials include acoustic varieties, not just electromagnetic ones and the principle is fairly similar, and in fact a bit easier as sound wavelengths our ears can hear range from a couple centimeters for the highest frequencies to about 20 meters for the lowest, as opposed to nanometers for visible light. Needless to say, being able to hide sound is handy, not just for cohort scouting parties or sonar protection for submarines. Tanks make far more noise than cars, and cars make so much noise we have to erect sound walls along highways in urban areas. It also offers better quality speakers and microphones, potentially far thinner sound insulation and so on. So it's also a type of metamaterial and one with a lot of valuable applications. Further, since sound and thermal transfer are heavily related in terms of conduction, it could offer some impressive applications for heating and cooling too. Let us also not forget that you can move stuff with sound too, and very directed sound lenses might have some applications for real life equivalents of tractor beams or shields, though obviously not for in space since they need air or some other medium to function. This is just a short list of potential applications for metamaterials, and we expect far more to be thought up as we further develop them. It's almost impossible to overstate their potential impact on civilization or foresee all the possible applications, any more than the first folks who experimented with semiconductors could, or even those who turned them into transistors. They are potentially a huge part of our future and one you can expect to see affect every aspect of our homes and lives, and probably sooner than later. This is tech for the next generation, not far future blue sky technology. And again one of those is for very light encryption of portable devices which is going to be an increasingly big deal as we head into the future. In fact encryption and privacy is going to be one of the major topics we cover this spring and summer as we revisit post-scarcity civilizations and see some of the very real challenges facing civilizations that on first glance look like they want for nothing, 
Like today's episode and next week's, that topic, Life in a Post-Scarcity Civilization, came out on top of our most recent episode topic poll on Patreon, but I can't see doing it in just one episode. Just discussing something like privacy concerns in a high-tech civilization can easily use an entire episode to itself. Good timing for that particular topic too since we are welcoming on board a new channel sponsor, NordVPN, and you can learn more about them at nordvpn.com slash Isaac. I don't have to tell you that privacy is a big concern on the internet, especially in this era of wireless devices where you're often connected to a public network you have no control over, and a VPN, a virtual private network, encrypts and reroutes all your data so that even a public network becomes a secure private one. And it's not about shadowy folks hacking your banking or email in an era when it seems like everyone from Facebook to Microsoft to Google to your own ISP is essentially spying on you and often reselling the data they collect. I've been using a VPN when online for some time. One downside of having a big presence online here on YouTube and social media is folks try to hack me a lot. There are YouTube channels that have been flat out stolen before, and we all know at least one Facebook friend who suddenly started posting strangely then posted later that they'd been hacked. For me a VPN is a simple necessity, but having a virtual private network really eases your mind if you do much online commerce, and especially over wireless interfaces. That added layer of military grade security and privacy to your personal online footprint is very comforting. And as we become increasingly digital and wireless, it is going to be more of a necessity. But NordVPN offers a very low price, fast, and reliable VPN service that is also intuitively simple to use, something a lot of other VPNs I've encountered are not. It has a lot of handy features, but to me, the best one is that it's so easy and seamless you don't even notice it's there. If you want to learn more about those other features though, visit nordvpn.com slash Isaac and get 77% off a 3 year plan today. As mentioned, next week we will be looking at portable power and discuss not just modern approaches to move energy around for mobile applications, but more advanced possible approaches like storing energy as antimatter or light. For alerts when that and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, this is Isaac Arthur saying thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. 